before we look at Luke chapter 3, I just wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you've heard some momentous news. And often you can remember where you were when you heard it. So for example, I remember vividly where I was and what I was doing when I heard the momentous news of the death of Princess Diana. And I remember it was a Sunday morning. I was sitting at breakfast, the radio was on, I'd just been out uh, giving out some gospel leaflets actually, early morning down a road, putting them through the door. I got home, turned the radio on, and there was this momentous news about Princess Diana. I remember where I was when the Twin Towers happened. I was sitting on a white sofa upstairs in a house in Sicily. I also remember when the Berlin Wall came down, and I'll tell you why I remember that, it's because I was there. I was quite young then, but um, I was there when the Berlin Wall came down, and Pink Floyd was in concert in Berlin. Now, today's episode is something quite momentous. Jesus is appearing publicly, and he is God's salvation. He is coming to bring salvation to men and women. And it's a big event. It's momentous. Jesus is God. He's Yahweh in the flesh. He's God the Son. Now, but in today's secular culture, of course, we minimize Jesus. We relativize Jesus. You know, Jesus isn't that momentous. Uh, you can go to Waterstones. You can find books about Jesus alongside Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius. You'll find him on the sh somewhere up the top in the self-help or the religion section. And it's very easy to walk past. We don't tend to uh, think it's that momentous. Occasionally, though, you get a secular person who actually realizes, no, Jesus is momentous. This fellow, H.G. Wells, the writer of War of the Worlds, um, he said this, I'm a historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. So he recognized it, even though he wasn't a believer. And also, you know, Jesus is momentous because we have our entire dating system around him. You know, BC, AD. I know nowadays they call it BCE and CE, common era. But originally it was before Christ and Anno Domini. So what I'm trying to get across, this passage today is something momentous. We read it and think, oh, I've read that before. It's meant to be a momentous fanfare presentation of Christ coming as saviour. I was going to read you the first couple of verses. In the 15th year, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, Trachonitis, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. This is Bible humor because in all these big names, and where does God's word go? To a man in the wilderness. He bypasses the big and the proud and comes to the humble. And I just want to mention the word wilderness. It's the place where God speaks to his prophets. You know, God spoke to Moses in the wilderness. God spoke to Elijah in the wilderness. God spoke to John the Baptist in the wilderness. There are many prophets where God spoke. And I want to encourage you all that we sometimes need to go back and spend some time in the wilderness. Without your Wi-Fi, without your TV and the radio, all the great rivers of the world begin in lonely places, high up, rocky places, little springs, that's where it starts. If you get alone with God, things can begin to flow. So let's come back to it. But what I want to focus on, as well as that, is this fact that it's a momentous occasion. This is global. You see, I think what Luke is doing, he's listing all these big figures because he wants us to understand that the coming of Jesus is a momentous global event. It's a bit like if I were to say, in the presidency of Joe Biden... Whilst Vladimir Putin was president of Russia, whilst Xi Jinping was president of China, whilst Rishi Sunak was the prime minister of Britain, the word of God came to Ray Smith in Ewell. And it's kind of to make it sound globally important. This is something momentous that we need to listen to the fact that Christ is coming. That the author of Luke and Acts 
He latches on to four important figures. He follows John the Baptist. He follows Jesus in the book of Luke. And then in the book of Acts, he follows Peter for the first 12 chapters or so. And then he follows Paul. But I wonder if you've ever noticed this. Whenever these big men of God, when they're introduced, there's always an Old Testament passage that gets quoted near the start of their ministry. And it's an outline of the kind of ministry they're going to do. But John the Baptist, with his one, we get a quote from Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. It's that bottom section there. And this Old Testament quote is designed by Luke to help us understand this is what John's going to be all about. This is his whole ministry. It's like an outline. So let's just read it. He went into the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. It says in that Old Testament quote from Isaiah 40, a voice. Who is the voice? It's John. John is the voice. He is preparing a way for the Lord. Now, in the original Hebrew, that word Lord means Yahweh, God, the God of Israel. So, this Old Testament passage, what it's saying is it is Yahweh, and the context of that Isaiah passage is the Lord himself, the divine shepherd, is going to bring his people out of exile back into the promised land. So you've got this image of a divine shepherd bringing people out of slavery back to the promised land, like a shepherd carries um, lambs in his arms, like a shepherd who leads his sheep. And what's the point of all of this? Well, it's there at the bottom, that all people will see God's salvation. But I want to ask the question, why do you think Luke spends two whole chapters talking about babies and talking about John the Baptist and Elizabeth? Why doesn't he just get on with it? Why doesn't Luke just dive straight in like Mark does in his gospel and say, Jesus appeared and started doing this, that, and the other. Why the long run in? Why two chapters of infancy narratives? Why? Is it? I'll tell you why. You see, Luke is going back not just to the birth of Jesus or even prophecies about him. He's going further back to the birth of John the Baptist, who's the guy who prepared the way. Why does Luke bother to focus on the man who prepared the way? Because this is momentous. This is so momentous. God, Luke doesn't want us to miss that this is the biggest thing that's ever happened on planet Earth, apart, of, apart from the cross. It's the biggest thing. And he doesn't want us to, he wants every person to see this is God's salvation coming to Earth. Don't miss it. It's, it's momentous. The Lord's arrival is momentous. It brings global salvation. In other words, I don't mean everyone will be saved, but what I mean is anyone, everyone, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and wants him can be saved. It's momentous, and it's for everyone. So if it's so momentous, what do we have to do? We must repent. We must repent. What does it mean to repent? To repent means to change your mind about your sin. <clears throat> sin is no longer something to flirt with. It's something to be forsaken. It also means changing your mind about Jesus Christ. No longer is Jesus to be treated lightly. No longer is Jesus to be mocked and ignored. He is the Savior and Lord to be clung to and worshipped. I'm going to talk today a little bit about repentance. But let's just look a bit further. Um, that, those verses, verses 4 to 5, is really a job description of John. This is what John did. 
He went around preparing the way for the Lord, making straight paths for him, filling in valleys. It's imagery. But what it's an imagery of is the call to repent. We told people to repent so that they could be ready for the Lord, so that the Lord would have a straight, smooth road to come into their lives. And if you like, John was a spiritual bulldozer. He was a bulldozer. Uh, in the sense he had to move things, and it was very difficult, but God was with him. Now, we are experts at ignoring this. I know I am. Because, you see, we can think repentance, yeah, that's okay when I become a Christian, but, you know, it's something I can ignore now. But this isn't quite what this scripture is saying. It says that we need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, um, and repentance is necessary in Scripture. It's necessary for salvation, along with, obviously, faith in Jesus Christ. You see, repentance is meant to be a result of our true faith in Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to show you an object now, which comes from my uncle's house. That he loved trains, and I'm going to show you a train. Salvation is putting your trust in Jesus. He's the one who died for you. You need Jesus, right? You can't get into heaven yourself. Jesus is like the, tr the engine. He's like the engine. Without the engine, you, don't, you ain't going nowhere. Jesus is like the engine. But do you ever see an engine on its own very often? It's normally followed by something, isn't it? So I have now got, this is the coal tender, which kind of matches on the back. Now, our repentance, our holy life, is like the thing that follows it. It's like the, the, the wagon. Now, you, the train can go for quite a bit without that, of course. The train is the important thing. But we must put our faith in Jesus, but show our trust with a life of repentance. One way we're good at ignoring it is to go with the culture, the latest views uh, of the culture. Now, I'm not going to go into anything controversial this morning, you know, like the sexuality debate, for example. Maybe I'll just pick one. It's just an example of how we can go with the culture's latest ideas and ignore the Bible. The, the act of sex outside of marriage. You know, the Bible is pretty clear that it's meant to be something, sex is meant to be something within marriage. Now, I once knew a church, and I was friends with people in this church. There were 700 people in this church. It was a Pentecostal church. I won't tell you which one. 700 people, really big. They had a big youth work and youth leaders, but it was quite well known that a lot of the youth leaders and some of the youth were sleeping together, and it wasn't being preached that this is wrong. Um, and they just kind of, well, it's what the culture says. That's just an example of how we can sort of think, oh, well, the culture is the important thing. And, but if you have that attitude, what you're really saying is repentance is an optional extra. Repentance isn't necessary. Um, it's a, something we can agree to disagree over. Whereas I want to say to you that repentance is of first order importance. Um, it's a first order issue. And we don't like it. It's difficult. But God wants us to hear this teaching. Here's another little way we can fool ourselves. A lie that we feed ourselves with sometimes is we can say, well, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I'm in the club, I'm fine, I go to a sound Bible teaching church. Um, look at my record. I'm in the club. So it doesn't really matter how I live. I don't have to be that repentant, really. God will wink at it. But you see, <clears throat> the people in John's day had the same approach. You see, the equivalent for the people who listened to John at the River Jordan was this. They said in verse 8, they were saying, we are children of Abraham. We have Abraham as our father. We are Jewish. We're in the club. So we don't really need to repent. We're part of God's people. But John says to them in verse 8, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. He says, I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. So what John is saying to them is it's not enough to be in the club if you refuse to repent. Later on in Luke's gospel, we read of a man called Zacchaeus in chapter 19. 
And in that chapter, Zacchaeus is a man who does repent. And what does Jesus say about him? Jesus says these words in Luke 19, verse 9. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a child of Abraham or a son of Abraham. In other words, to be a genuine believer, we must trust in Jesus, but there must be the fruit of repentance in our lives. Here are three things I want to say about repentance. This is an uncomfortable message, but it's important we hear this teaching. We must repent humbly, urgently, and practically. Let's look at the word humbly. Now, John the Baptist, he baptized people into the River Jordan. And the River Jordan is on the edge of the Promised Land, okay, of Israel. So, if you were going to get baptized there, it was like you were saying, I've got to come out of the promised land and re enter it again. It was as if you were saying, I've got to start again. That's why God chose the River Jordan, I believe, because it's on the edge of the promised land. So, they had to kind of, at these people who were saying, We're Jews, you know, we're, we're in the club. John's saying, No, you've got to go to the river, be washed. And come back into the promised land. It's almost like saying start again. And because of that Isaiah passage, what John is kind of trying to get across them is this. You're, yeah, you're in the promised land. You, you're living physically in the promised land. Yeah, you, you're in the club. Yeah, you've come back from exile. You come back from Babylon. You're here. But spiritually, you still need to come out of exile. Spiritually, you still need this shepherd to bring you in. Spiritually, you need forgiveness. You need to be washed. You need to come again and be really part of God's people. This is the message. It was very humbling for a Jew. You know, why do I need to do that? And the other reason, I don't know if this is true, but some scholars think that you only baptized people who are non-Jews to make them Jews. I think it comes from the story of Naaman the Syrian, when the Gentile Naaman was, he was baptized in a river uh, to say, you know, because he started to believe in the God of Israel. Well, imagine it, if a Jew, a person who believes they're Jewish and a child of Abraham is told they've got to get baptized. It's like saying, well, I'm already Jewish. Why do I need to do something that a non-Jew has to do to become a Jew? Very humbling. He also went even further. I mean, you think my sermon's bad today. You should have been there when John the Baptist preached. <laughs> you know, he said this. He said, you brood of vipers. How insulting that John the Baptist said this to Jewish people. I mean, it's like saying to them, you are part of the problem. He's saying to these Jews, you are on the side of the serpent. You think you've got it all right, but you've got to repent. You've got to come humbly. The thing about a snake is it can change its skin and appear all new, but it's still the same old snake underneath. And sometimes people get religious. You know, they get religious, but they're not changed inside. They're still the same person. But God doesn't want outward change. He doesn't want us just to change our outward coat by, you know, doing this and doing that. He wants us to humble ourselves and say, I, I need you, Lord. John said, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. But it means when you're going to chop a tree down, you aim the axe, you lay it at the root, and you're about to swing, and you get the mark ready. And what John was saying to these Jews, he was saying, you're proud, like a proud tall tree. You're like a proud tree, you're like this. I'm Jewish. And he's saying, that's not enough. You've got to repent. And if you go around saying, I'm a proud tree, God's going to chop you down. Oh, so repentance for these people was very humbling. Don't rely on the fact you come to church or you're in a club, but walk with the Lord. Uh, urgently, the other thing that uh, John said to them really was that they needed to be urgent. Now, if the axe is waiting to chop the tree, then it's urgent. You've got to you know, repent. So why do we need to repent urgently? That if you don't repent today, you don't actually know if you will be able to repent in the future. You lose the ability to repent. 
if you don't act on what God says. The reason I know this is because of what happened to the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they refused to listen to John the Baptist. They said, we're Jewish. We don't need that. They refused to repent and they wouldn't get baptized by him. But if you read on in Luke's gospel to Luke chapter 7, verse 29, this is what happens in Luke 7, 29. The tax collectors, when they heard Jesus, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. And they had repented. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. In other words, years earlier, they had said, no, I refuse to repent. And years later, when Jesus, very Jesus Christ, is standing in front of them doing miracles, they don't want to know. They, they can't respond anymore. They've lost the ability to repent. So this is a bit of a scary scripture today. I'm sorry, but the scary scripture is if we ignore God and just resist him, resist him, resist him, there comes a day when you can't respond anymore. Do you remember this fellow? Herod, King Herod. King Herod refused to repent when John the Baptist preached and said, you know, it's wrong that you're taking your brother's wife. He says, you need to repent. And Herod refused it. And in the end, Herod had him executed. He had John the Baptist beheaded. He killed God's voice. He refused to repent. And then what happens later? Jesus appears to him in Luke 23. And in chapter 23, Herod is all excited. Herod asks him lots of questions. Oh, show me a miracle. Do this, do that, do the other. And what does Jesus do? Jesus says nothing to him. Because he had his chance. Jesus was silent. And that is quite scary. I mean, I have a friend, I can't give you his name. He was a Christian. He was um, really involved in church. And he went to Oxford University, my friend. And at Oxford University, he listened to Richard Dawkins and lots of big intelligent professors. And he started to become hardened. And he started to think, I don't need to really take the Lord seriously. And over time, he gradually became harder and harder. We took him on an alpha course again, and he rejected it. And um, he's still at this time hardened. And I, I, you know, we still pray for him, of course. But all I'm saying is if God ever puts his finger on something, try and obey. Because the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. Now, let's move on. I've got some really good news at the end, by the way, to cheer you all up. But I think it's important we hear this teaching. There's no point glossing over it. What also repentance is, it's practical. It's not, it's not just um, feeling sorry. It's not just crying, and, oh, I'm sorry, and being sad and remorseful. In this book, in Luke 3, the, the repentance is extremely practical. Because what, uh, John, what does John tell them to do when they say, what do we do? He tells them this. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? He said, don't collect any more than you're required to. He told them. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. It was very, very, very practical. He doesn't tell them to go and live in a monastery or to just cry a lot. He tells them to go back to their jobs do what they've always done, but do it differently. Be generous, be honest, show integrity, be content, don't accuse people, don't lie, don't be greedy. So a repentant life is very, very practical and should be obvious from 50 paces. It should be obvious. So in our own lives, maybe we can think, what would it mean in my situation to live differently for God? Is there anything I need to do differently? Is there anything God's putting his finger on? I remember what happened to me, a personal story, very quickly before I finish. I became a Christian at Exeter University, and I had a great time. And then I started to feel the Lord put his finger on something. And I went home, looked in the garage, and there were all these weights from a weightlifting, barbells and dumbbells, and they were all stolen from my school. I'd nicked them from the gym at the school. When I was at secondary school, I went and nicked all the weights. 
And the teachers came in one day and all the weights were gone. And I took them home to do all my biceps, you know. Anyway, I became a Christian and I felt the Lord telling me, take them back. So I had to go and rest, I had to go and confess and say, look, I nicked your weights. Here they are. And they were very grateful. I don't think they ever used them, but, you know, it's practical. Um, it might mean you're being more honest with your tax return. It might mean, um, you know, with copyright. I mean, this, just to let you know, there's a big, big picture on the front of this um, presentation, the first slide. And I had to buy that image. I had to pay for it because I was going to try and nick it off of Google. But I felt the Lord say, no, you pay for it if it's copyrighted. You know, you've got to be practically honest, little things. Um, even stealing a pen from the office, you know, it might be, you take a pen, oh, it doesn't matter, it's just a pen, but it's still theft, isn't it? <laughs> Repentance is practical. I'll tell you a quick funny story. There was a man who owed the inland revenue some tax. He'd been dodging it. And um, he became a Christian and he wrote to the inland revenue and he said, um, I've become a Christian and I, I need to get more honest and I can't sleep at night. I can't sleep at night, so here's 100 pounds. Then he wrote at the bottom of the letter, if I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Repentance is practical. But the good news is this. Jim read about Jesus getting baptized as well. Now, Jesus, he stood in our place. You see, all these people queuing up to be baptized and repenting, we're sinners, like you and me. Sinners in need of grace. But the good news is that Jesus himself came and stood in our place. He identifies with you and me. He doesn't tell you just to pull your socks up. He came in your place with the sinners in the River Jordan to be baptized, to identify with you and me. And what Jesus is really saying is, I'm with you. I'm going to die and rise again for you. Because when Jesus went under the water and came up again, it was, it was like he was accepting the truth that he has to go to the cross and die and rise again. Jesus says, I'm going to die and rise again for all these people here. I stand in their place. I will pay the price of, your, of their sin. Jesus stood in your place and paid for your sin. So all you've got to do is come to Jesus. Yeah, repent, but come to Jesus. It's all washed away. It's all forgiven. He paid for you and God will say over you the things he said over Jesus when he said, you are my son. With you, I love, I love. And with you, I'm well pleased. That's what God will say to you. He'll say, oh, he'll say like, um, Mandy, pick on Mandy. Mandy, you're my beloved child. With you, I'm well pleased. Now, you might think I'm not very pleased. God thinks you're, he, he says, I'm pleased with you because you're in Christ. As long as you keep clear of anything you know to be sin. There will be moments when there are things that God says, deal with that. And I want to encourage you, don't leave it. Deal with it so that you can stay. If you um, do it, then you will go into clarity. You will go into more love for the Lord. But if you stubbornly refuse to deal with something God puts his finger on, you'll become more foggy. You'll become more entrenched. You'll become more stubborn and more deaf. Uh, unless the Lord has mercy. The Lord's coming is momentous, so we must repent humbly, urgently, practically. But the good news is Jesus stood with sinners and stood in our place in the River Jordan. Lord, thank you that you don't shy away from teaching us the need to repent. And I pray that you will help us reflect if there's any area in our lives we could perhaps put right. But also, Lord, we thank you that it's not just all about us, but it's about you, that you stood in our place. You came as a saviour. You went to the cross and rose again. And uh, Lord, there's always hope uh, in you. Uh, thank you. The door is always open for those who will listen. So bless us, Lord, and help us walk repentant lives uh, and as we follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen.